Hello there and welcome to the Construction Revolution podcast. My name is Andrew Fahim and here on the show we explore the latest trends, technologies, people and organizations that are revolutionizing or disrupting the construction industry and are changing what the industry will look like tomorrow. Today on the show I'm speaking with Renee Morcos, the founder and CEO of Alice Technologies. Rene is also an adjunct professor at Stanford University, where he teaches in the PhD construction management program. After spending years working on major construction projects all over the world, Rene developed Alice, an AI-powered construction simulation and optimization platform. So Renee, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about Alice today with us. Um, we're very excited to have you. Um, maybe just to start a little bit, let us know about yourself, your background. I see that you come from a civil engineering background, uh, worked as a field engineer and a project manager um, in many different countries on many different very cool projects. So tell us a little bit about how your background relates to Alice. When did you maybe get this, you know, eureka moment or this light bulb moment of starting Alice? What sort of gaps did you see? in the industry that you thought, hey, I have the technology to solve. Yeah, so, so uh, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here, Andrew. Um, so my background, I when I graduated high school, my dad's a civil engineer. So my, when I graduated high school, my dad gave me a good piece of advice. He said, hey, son, study anything you want, just don't do civil engineering, right? And so I was like, okay, I now, uh, I now know exactly what I need to do. So I, I obviously picked civil engineering. Um, I've been uh, in construction my whole life. My dad was in construction before me. Um, yeah, I like building things. I always did. Uh, I would actually cut uh, cut class in my bachelor's degree and go to construction sites. Um, I, th- I don't know if my professors knew at the time, but I, I literally like I would knock on construction sites. I would find the coolest projects in town. That that's you know underwater construction or large you know university campus, um, and I'd offer my services for free. You know, and I just like to to build things. Um, you know, I started as an assistant site foreman when I was 17, worked my way up the ranks, became a site engineer, project manager, you know, then built several, uh, went to Afghanistan, uh, designed, built, procured my own jobs from scratch with a German contractor, um, ended up doing a PhD at Stanford, uh, did uh, six months, study six month work, so I, you know, kind of paid for the program, um, then uh, ended up you know, spinning out the PhD into what is today Alice Technologies, right? Um, yeah, the, 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 the technology itself um, is, it's the world's first generative construction simulator. And so it, it, it's capable of generating millions of different ways of building a given construction project, right? And so that's, that's a little bit of the background. Um, another question you asked me is, is, you know, how did I, like, what was the, what was the key moment of realizing this, you know, thinking like, hey, I need to go build this, this technology. And so it's actually, I, I wish there was one, there's two, right? There's two, two moments over the last, you know, almost 20 years at this point, right? But the first moment is somewhere in 2005, I'm building these landing strips for F-16s, right, in, in Kabul. Right? You know, exotic kind of location, right, maybe exotic kind of, you know, project, but, you know, it's a concrete slot, right? And, um... You know, the sun's rising, it's really cold, right? People don't realize how freezing it is. And I'm trying to figure out how to sequence the work. You know, I had, I think, 33 people. So I was like, oh, well, if I put, like, six people here to do the steel, and then I move them over there, and then, they, you know, they do the, the form work. Well, then I can't do the form work here. Then I got to switch them this way, you know. And so I remember thinking, like, man, I, I got to be stupid. Like, I can't, I can't seem to figure this out, right? And so I thought to myself, okay, well, let me go learn how the pros do it. Right, let me go to the U.S. Like you know, the, you know, I went to USC, got my master's degree there, and I, and I kept really looking for this tool. I kept looking for this tool that would solve that specific problem. Like, how do I build the darn thing? How do what do I do? What do I do? And so I didn't find that USC. So I thought to myself, Stanford. Right? If, if anybody's got it in the world, I'll find it at Stanford. Showed up at Stanford, started working on their on their stuff there. Right. Um, the uh, that was kind of the first moment. The second moment was. This kind of went on the back burner, and I was looking for a research topic as a PhD student. You know, every PhD student needs a good good research topic. And I remember being on a construction site that was late. It was six weeks late. Every day is 50,000 euros. That's a lot of stress. People were really stressed out. You know, um, and I remember, you know, the subcontractor saying, like, look, I can't work any faster. I can't work any faster. I'm working as fast as I can. 
And so I, I got up, looked outside the window, and I see 100,000 square foot of empty space and six people standing there. Right. And, that's, and it hit me. I was like, wow. Because I, you know, even though I was like, what, 26 at the time, I'd already worked on probably 20 construction sites. Right, from all the free work that I used to do when I was studying and then, you know, from Afghanistan, right? So, and I realized, like, every project I've ever seen looks empty. Really. Like, drive down a highway, look at a construction project, right? It, it looks empty. Like, there might be a few workers, some pockets of work, but it looks empty. So, started measuring construction space utilization. Right? On, on average, how much of the space is actually being used to build, right? And how much of it is empty. And, um... The answer, actually, you know, really surprised me and, and everybody else that saw the data. That it was three percent. Yeah. Wow. Three percent of space is used for construction. It's like ninety-seven percent of the space is just sitting there. It's like, well, that really, you know, tells us that hey, there's probably a way to accelerate this. So I started, you know, looking at ways to increase the space usage, right? And that led me to start developing algorithms that could resequence work, right? Because if you resequence it, you can make it denser, right? Mm-hmm. And then I showed it to the project manager. Project manager sort of looked at the results. And that's where it hit me. I was like, whoa, I set out to sort of solve this space usage thing, but the algorithm knows how to build. Mm-hmm. But that was kind of the remarkable, this like really kind of big moment, you know, for me, because it was like, wait, this, this, it was kind of like getting something to, to giving something life, you know, it's suddenly like you're like, whoa, it, it, it knows how to build. Like it doesn't know how to build very well. Right, like we got to teach it that, but it knows how to build. And so I remember kind of getting back on the plane, you know, across the Atlantic because the project was in the Netherlands at the time, and you know, really sitting there on this airplane, kind of like thinking, like, man, this thing knows how to build, you know. And then so from that, I went back to the original problem, which is, hey, can I like, can I get, can I get an algorithm to solve the construction problem, to sequence the work, right? So that's kind of where where it came from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So you said something that maybe caught my ear and I want to understand a little bit more about it. Uh, generative design, what is that and how is it different from what we're doing day to day? Okay. So it's generative construction simulation. Okay. The, the way that I explain it is, is, you know, let me start with explaining parametric design. Okay. A, it exists. B, it's relatively easy to explain. So if you don't know anything about parametric design, you'll be an expert in about 30 seconds. Let's say you're drawing a, 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 a cylinder, a cup. Okay. You draw a circle, a circle, and a plane. You want a bigger cup, you redraw it. Smaller cup, you redraw You got to redraw the cup every time, right? Somebody came along and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to make this tool parametric. I'm going to have a height and a radius. I change the parameter, the tool redraws the object, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, think about if you're designing, say, a car engine, right? You know, Engineer Mary says, hey, I need to change the... Uh, diameter of the pipe from one inch to half an inch, right? Um, back in the day, you had to change all the cross sections, all the elevations. You had to change all of that, right? Uh, today, you know, you just change the number, right? And the change ripples through your system. So that's what what BIM is. BIM is two technologies: parametric and it's object oriented. So a BIM tool understands that it's a column made of concrete on the third floor, and it's parametric. So if you change the height of the, the, the columns, all the, the heights in, 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 your, in your model change. Look at the 2D changes, the 3D changes, all that stuff changes. Right? And this ripple through effect is, is the way that I explain parametric to myself. What is generative? Generative is, is, well, you know, one of the great things about being human is that we were lazy. Right? And so I don't want to change the parameters manually. I want you, the computer, to change, you know, look, explore, you know, all the height radius all the radii from one inch to two inches, right? And give me the, the, the number that gives me the greatest power output or the greatest rentable area or the minimum energy needs for my building or whatever that is. So that's, you know, parametric design is when you can change the parameters and the change ripples through. Generative design is when you can now get the computer to, to explore lots of options and then pick the best one. I see. So you focus a lot more on the output itself and then the generation is done by the algorithm which you're training on some data. So the, this has been done in design over the last, say, 30 years. It's never been done in construction. It's been deemed impossible, truthfully, up to now. And that's what we've done at Alice. We have created a generative construction simulator. So what, what it, And the way it works, right, and this is the part that you know, a lot of people, wait, how, how is that possible? You set up a rule set that governs your project. The rule set is how many tasks, how many crews, how many calendars, and what do you need to run a construction project? You set that up. You give it to the computer, it crunches all of those variables for you and gives you the 
um, gives you the the fastest or the cheapest solutions. Right, so that's mm-hmm. how it works. Okay, very interesting. So one thing that we discuss a lot here in the whole Zigi attack is data. So obviously, we know that those algorithms that we build are just as good as the data we provide to them. So they rely on this data when we do algorithm training, for example. Maybe tell us a little bit more about the background of how Alice was built, what sort of data was it trained on, um, just the process of developing such an algorithm. Yeah, that's a great question. Here's the thing that um, is kind of a harsh reality, which is that our field does not have a readily available repository of data that you can use to train a schedule, right? And I remember, and, and, and I'll give you the sort of counterpoint. So somebody might be listening to this podcast and think, wait, wait, what do you mean? Like I have, there was a, there was a gentleman that, that, that sort of, you know, came to me maybe four years ago and said, hey, you know, I have 40,000 schedules, right? With the actuals, with everything else. And, 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 and if you're lucky, you know, I'll sell them to you. And I remember thinking like, well, the issue with the schedules is they're not connected to a 3D model. They're not connected to a design. They're almost never resource loaded, right? Like, it is extremely difficult to get the information you need out of a schedule, right? Because in my opinion, you do need all the, the above. You need to be connected to the design. You need to know what floor it's on, if it's a column, if it's a slab, you know. And there's, sure, you could use AI to kind of glean some of that information from the task descriptions, but still, you won't have the quantities, you won't have the production rates, and you won't have the resource loading. Right? And so what we realized early on was that the data that you need to feed the system sits inside the head of the construction folk that are running the project. And so that's kind of the trick, is, is what we did was we created a effectively a translator, a way in which you can get the information out of your head into what the computer can understand. That's the, the big deal. That's the thing that we invented that didn't exist before. And so you can kind of say, well, I know how to build, you know, towers or, or parking lots or hospitals, or whatever it is, but I now have a way to get the information out of my head into the computer, which is, is a big deal. And the other thing that I think is a big deal is that we figured out how to do it scalably. So, you know, normally when people want to simulate, they'll need to generate, you know, a list of 3,000 or 4,000 tasks, you know, which is not... You know, scalable. It, it it can't be done, and we think that's in a way that's error free. With Alice, you can basically create the recipe. Right? Create. This is how you build a column. Apply it to all the columns. This is how you build a slab. Apply it to all the slab. So you can create fifteen of these recipes, and those automatically generate five or six thousand tasks, and the computer crunches those tasks for you. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's very cool. So what are some of the benefits that a user can see when using Alice versus, for example, using conventional methods of planning or estimating? It's about 17% faster in duration, and about 13% cheaper in labor and equipment costs. That's what we see. Okay. Yeah. And it's kind of converged. I mean, those numbers, you know, d- depending on which data set we look at, it might be 16, it might be 18, but you can kind of bet, bet on it. You'll tend to see a lower, um, a lower number for sort of long linear projects, there's less like sequencing options. And so in those projects, we'll tend to see, I think the lowest we've seen is like sort of that three to 5% improvement on the duration. All right, on the labor and equipment costs, we might also drop down to say that three to 5%. The good news is that for long linear projects, they tend to have a very clear idea of how they're building it. So even that, you know, 5% or 3%, you know, over the course of a year, um, you know, results in, in you know, two weeks savings, right? And that, that is substantial, mm-hmm. right? On the upper end, you know, what we'll see with commercial jobs, you'll see up to 30, 35%, yeah. Wow. That's obviously very significant numbers, but still when you present these numbers to day-to-day construction practitioners, how much of a challenge has it been to convince people to convert to these methods? Do people usually, are people usually skeptical about this? Do they just jump on the opportunity right away? What has been your thoughts on just getting people to adopt such technologies? I always say, you know, we encourage healthy skepticism. Right, you know, my, I usually end end my my initial calls with clients you know, when I first meet them and say like, don't don't take my word for it, take it for a spin, you know, go try it yourself. Right, um, I can I can sell you on, on the technology for ten hours, right, until you you know 
get in the jet and go fly around, you, you, you won't believe me, right? Um, yeah, the, 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 the truth is, especially lately, I mean, we started to have a bit of a name, right? People have heard of us. So the skepticism, you know, maybe like three years ago, people were like, ah, no, no, no friggin' way. Like, there's no way that this thing can do what you say, right? Now, you know, people are like, well, I heard of you guys, you know, my, my, my friend, you know, used it, someone else used it, you know, um, let me try it. You know, I, I, I don't know if it does everything you, you say it does, but, but I'm willing to kind of work with you and, and see it. And so, yeah, and, and you know, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll be up and running in, you know, two, three weeks, right? And, and you'll start to see the, the impact relatively quickly. Okay. So I've been looking at Alice Manage. Maybe tell me a little bit about the features of Alice Manage. Who's your typical user? What would they use it for? And how does it help the customers? This is a big, big deal for us. We... Up to now, up to about six months ago, we had Alice pre-construction. So it's the ability to set up a project and you know simulate it and then figure out the best way that you're going to build it. Uh, we did not have the ability to update progress and manage the construction during construction. So that's what we released about six months ago. It has obviously been a, a very big shift, you know, a uh, very positive sort of change for us. Um, it's really changed the usable user patterns it's changed the the, the number of um, use cases the value proposition all that stuff is, is, is improved you know, dram- dramatically I would say um, the manage feature is the ability to update to set a data date update progress you can do that either by importing a p6 you can do that by uh, importing an Excel spreadsheet or you can do that manually by clicking on uh, each task individually or you can just click on a group of tasks and mark those complete right um, and then from there, what's really cool is that you can then say, okay, maintain sequence for all tasks. So if I was, you know, building A, then B, then C, even if there's a problem with A, I want you to continue, you know, wait till A can be built and then do B and C. You can then unlock sequence. You can say, hey, resequence all remaining tasks to, to mitigate for delays. Um, very, very powerful feature. And so to give you an idea, let's say a project is four weeks late. Resequencing can usually bring you, you know, typically you'll see sort of two, three weeks of that delay knocked off relatively easily just by resequencing. Um, yeah, if the delay was say two weeks, resequencing usually kind of covers most of, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll remove the two week delay, right? The delay was say three months, and that's where it starts to say, okay, well, resequencing maybe will remove a month, a month and a half, but you'll probably need to add resources, right, to make up for it. This is just kind of from playing around with the tool, you know, I'm starting to kind of see what it can do. Um, the other thing you can then obviously do is you can say, hey, add resources or, or add a crane. Or And what's really great about this technology is that it, it shows you where's the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak, right? So to mitigate delays, there's usually, you know, at least six or seven different ways you can do it, right? But what's the most cost effective, right? And, and, and you know, I'm thinking of an example where it was like, well, actually, you don't need to do overtime for everybody. Do overtime for steel workers in October, right? It was September and October, I kind of forget now. But if you do overtime for steel workers in September and October, that's what's going to get you out of the gym, right? Don't worry about anything else, right? Uh, and so that's that's what you can do with the manage page, and it's it's very, very powerful. Wow, that is very powerful, having the ability to just look at all of these scenarios and getting hard numbers of how different these scenarios are. I can I can see the potential of that. Tell me maybe about what the future holds for Alice. What, uh, if you can tell me about anything that you guys are sort of working on under the hood, um, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of things, right? Recently, we released what we call selective objectives. So that's, you know, just fresh off the presses. And what that basically means is the objective function is the mathematical term for what you're trying to optimize for. So is it cost? Is it time? Is it quality? You know, that's your objective function. The selective objective is the ability to tell the software, hey, I want you to minimize the total number of cranes used. I want you to minimize total number of resources used. I want you to minimize cost or time. Um, I want you to minimize time on site. So get the crews to spend this minimum, you know, don't let them start and then have nothing to do and then leave and then come back and then leave and come back. Try to get them you know, all done in one go, right? Um, and that's one. We are looking at releasing a 2D version that doesn't need a BIM. So that's in the books. So you can just basically, you know, set up a, um, a group of boxes, you know, for the things that you want to build. So instead of needing to import some columns, you just create a box that says columns. So I think that's a big deal. We're working on communicating to the field. 
So outputting, you know, specific instructions. So you can literally click print and it gives you a little booklet that shows you on each day what you need to be doing, which crews are doing what, right? Um, it enables sort of poll planning, enables sort of, you know, uh, safety conversations and, and other things, right? Um, so those are kind of things that are being cooked up at Alice right now. It's awesome. So maybe if someone is listening to us and is interested to learn more about Alice or get to try it, uh, what, what should they do? Oh, just get on alicetechnologies.com and, and fill out the, uh, the, the contact, uh, you know, contact form and somebody will be in touch. Okay. It's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Renee. I enjoyed talking to you and learning about everything that us is developing. Um, I cannot wait to see the future that holds for Alice. And thank you so much for being with us. <laughs>